Nicole, I have some spectacular news for you. Oh, cool, Raleigh. What's up? Oh, man. Electric vehicles. We're selling so many of them that they are going to completely fix climate change without us having to change our behavior at all. It's a freaking miracle. Oh, boy. Do you know how many of the vehicles we've sold aren't electric? I mean, the way you're saying it, it's either really high or really low. So I'm going to say 0%. It's high. Oh, damn it. I have a very specific thing that I wanted to talk about this episode because I I think sometimes it can be easy to identify disinformation and misinformation, Mm. climate change isn't happening kind of stuff. Volcanoes are causing it all. Yes. No, volcanoes will stop it. No, it's it's volcanoes make more CO2 than humanity by a hundred million times or something. Right. Which is absolutely not true. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that'll be a future close. episode. But there's some kinds of climate disinformation and misinformation that just happen and they're insidious in that the car companies or fossil fuel companies like take advantage of the situation, mm. but that it's something that has sort of permeated culture. Okay. It's not disinformation in the way that we think about it, but it's still wrong and it's preventing us from addressing climate change. I cannot even wait. What is it? You don't have to wait one more second because what I'm talking about Hang is- Hang on the- one second. I got to take a phone call. Come on. Hello? Yes? Shit. My extended warranty? <laughs> Okay, you know what? I think that was spam. Go ahead. Okay. And I don't want to wait a single more second. Great. Because I want to talk about the idea that electric vehicles are going to freaking save us from climate change. And I want to talk about the outsized emphasis that they get in popular media and in government policy. Mm. And I consider this to be misinformation and disinformation because by prioritizing these things so much, we are giving the public the impression that this is the most important thing we can do. Oh, okay. So it technically could be helpful in aggregate, but there are solutions that are faster, better, that we're not thinking about because we're so obsessed with exactly. electric vehicles. Okay. And I want to start by saying that I think electric vehicles are part of the climate solution. We're going to probably do another episode about electric vehicles and about all of the misinformation and disinformation that people spread about them, about how they're actually worse for the planet than gas cars. That's not true. I will say there are like a host of negative environmental impacts associated with electric vehicles, which we'll talk about, and I don't want to brush past that, but that is used to make nobody buy electric vehicles and keep producing gas-powered cars. I want to be a little careful about that. So I want to talk a little bit about the claim itself first, you know, that EVs are the central part of our fight against climate change. Oh, Mm. also, I'm sure I've said the full term electric vehicles once by now, but if I haven't, EVs means electric vehicles. Thank God. I thought you were talking about that Pokemon that evolves into a bunch of different Pokemon, (laughs) depending on what kind of stone you put near it. No, I've had sex, so. (laughs) Brag. (laughs) According to the EPA, transportation makes up about 28% of emissions by economic sector, which is the largest part of the pie chart. When you take out stuff like aircraft and boats and other gas powered things, that number gets closer to 22%. Fucking boats, man. Uh, But still, it's, it's, you know, a quarter of our emissions. So we, one, run into the problem of even if we fix it 100%, we still have 75% of our emissions to deal with. But also, if I could snap my fingers and make 22% of our emissions go away tomorrow, that would be huge. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So how come I'm complaining? You know, am I a hypocrite? In certain ways, yes. Okay. I don't love Marvel movies, but Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage rules. Okay. Two I get thumbs it. up. <laughs> They should have put that on the poster. I think they did. Did they? This guy I know was like trying to get them to say that. And then he tweeted it enough times. Jordan Zakarian. That's, and then they said two tongues up. That's good marketing. It's good amazing, job, yeah. Jordan. The The main flaw with this line of thinking is that nearly all of America lives in a system that is designed around cars. And that system has way more climate impacts than just the cars themselves. Mm. So by focusing on electric cars at both the policy level and the popular level, we're sort of baking ourselves into this system that's still going to be really bad for the climate, even if every single vehicle on the road is a zero zero emissions vehicle, which, by the way, isn't really a thing, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And by that, I mean, we live in sprawled communities that often require you to have a car. Mm. It's harder to heat those houses. It's harder to provide electricity to all those individual houses. It's bad land use, just generally in terms of carbon capture and rainwater capture. There's a lot of reasons. It's very carbon intensive to build those suburbs. Mm. And so by 
conditioning ourselves to have that system and requiring more cars, it doesn't matter if all of those cars are EVs. Gotcha. So you know? you're, you're saying that like, okay, we're going to have a transportation sector. Mm -hmm. And instead of just transforming internal combustion engines for EV cars, we should be transforming the transportation sector into a public transportation forward, mm -hmm. more trains, more buses. And also, we probably shouldn't silo transportation away from things like housing mm. um, because really they are very interconnected. And, you know, at the policy level, a lot of times there are policies that involve both housing or construction and transportation. So it's not like they're two completely separate things that don't talk to each other. But when we think about climate policy specifically, a lot of times it's like EVs are here and then like lead buildings are mm. somewhere else. Yeah. And I guess it's it's like we need to make gradual steps. Big steps are hard to take. So what's a gradual step? We have internal combustion cars. Well, let's change them into electric cars. Mm -hmm. And like that is a gradual kind of easy step, like a A to B but we really should be going A to C. And in fact, going A to B locks us into the car dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I know some people out there are probably like, come on, Nicole. Come on, Nicole. N they sound like that. What, what else do they say? Uh, they say, nobody thinks that. Nobody only thinks that so. only EVs. Obviously, we don't only we, care uh, about EVs. We don't only care about EVs. That's exactly what they sound like. But if you look at the messaging around EVs, it sounds a lot like that. And I'm going to have you read the first few paragraphs of this article, including the title. Okay. Uh, this is from the New York Times, April 12th, 2023. So pretty recently. EPA lays out rules to turbocharge sales of electric cars and trucks. Turbocharge. Damn. The Biden administration is proposing rules to ensure that two-thirds of new cars and a quarter of new heavy trucks sold in the United States by 2032 are all electric. Okay. By Coral Davenport. <laughs> what a great name. Davin Coralport. All right. Here we go. Washington. <laughs> Chiron. <laughs> Wide shot. American flag. Up a pole. Some businessmen walking around. Washington. The Biden administration on Wednesday proposed the nation's most ambitious climate regulations to date. Two plans designed to ensure two-thirds of new passenger cars and a quarter of new heavy trucks sold in the U.S. are all electric by 2032. The new rules would require nothing short of a revolution in the U.S. auto industry, a moment in some ways as significant as the June morning in 1896 when Henry Ford took his horseless carriage for a test run and changed American life and industry. If the two rules from the Environmental Protection Agency are enacted as proposed, they would put the world's largest economy on track to slash its planet warming emissions at the pace that scientists say is required of all nations in order to avert the most devastating impacts of climate change. Thank you, Raleigh. I want to clear Coral Davenport's name here. I don't know what her relationship is with the auto industry or big oil or anything. I mean, she might just be given her name. She must hate CO two bleaching all of her brethren. You'd think in the so. Ocean. You'd think so. So I don't necessarily think this is a her problem. I think this is a Americans, humanity. We have cars everywhere. Problem. But there's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, it says that. It requires nothing short of a revolution in the U.S. auto industry, a moment in some ways as significant as when the car was invented in the first place. Wow. Which is just not true. <laughs> it's just fundamentally not true. It's we're changing the existing system we have a little bit. A teeny bit. And not just a teeny bit. We're just changing it the ratio because we yeah. already fucking have electric cars yes we've had yes. electric cars since like 2003 this feels like electric cars are mankind's greatest achievement since he harnessed fire oh yes and God. then in this last paragraph she says if the two rules are enacted they would put the world's largest economy on track to slash its planet warming emissions so it's this article is basically promising like EVs are going to get us there. It's going to get us maybe not all the way. It's going to it's going to get us on track. We're going to mm. it's like when you have a fundraiser and you got that big drawing of a thermometer and yeah. you can color in the thermometer red. It's going to color in a bunch of the thermometer red. Yeah. Well, I feel like I why a thermometer? Why I, is because it's like I hot? don't know. Because you also don't want to hit the top of the thermometer. If you hit the top of the thermometer, you have a fever. you're dead and the mercury flies out <laughs> and gets all over everybody. That's not a good Yeah, goal. not a good metaphor. Look, if you run a community center or church or whatever. In the 1930s. Work on another metaphor for your fundraising. Right. So this art there's a bunch of articles. There's one in Wired that's about 
I should have printed it out, but the title is literally something like EVs might really save us or something. There, There is this idea that EVs are the most important thing that we can do. Another fun part is like all these headlines are doing a ton of heavy lifting to couch it in other bullshit. Like yeah. lays out rules to turbocharge. Lays them out. Oh, yeah. it might really help us. Could be the next big thing. Yeah. Doctors hate him. That's all this <laughs> bullshit of like... Well, is it? Like, wh- what are the odds? Give me the Vegas odds yeah. on the top. It also, I love the use of the word turbocharge because it also, Im- I think, sneakily implies that electric cars are cool and I mean, it's like I, they're powerful. They're turbocharged. Yeah. And I guess it's, first of all, Coral Davenport almost certainly did not choose that headline. That's no, some The writers don't year choose old. the headline. Yeah. It's yeah. just A-B test. It could be AI even. It's yeah. just like the word turbocharge is better than, <laughs> uh, you know, generate or whatever. And it's also not just lip service. It's not just in the press that EVs are getting. One thing I learned while researching this episode is it's actually really hard to determine what percentage of what money is spent where. I wanted to get definitive answers about what percentage of the DOT budget or what percentage of the infrastructure bill or whatever are spent on electric cars. And Mm. that breakdown is like almost impossible to find. I reached out to people at various transportation nonprofits and most of them were like, we'll work on it and get back to you. (sighs) And then now we have to record the podcast and I don't think they ever found it. But I did find an article. That's not true. Our researcher James found an article for me um, that gives you some idea of how much of our budget is going to these EVs. So across the two laws, uh, which are the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the... Infrastructure bill. Surely. Bipartisan infrastructure bill, but it has a name that I can't remember, like IRJ, and I can't remember what that is. Brunswick Lanes on 6th and Kipling presents the infrastructure bill. Yes, that's it. Cannot believe they got that. Absolutely no Brunswick Lanes on 6th and Kipling. Well, they spent all their money on that (laughs) ad. (laughs) Regardless, across those two laws, $307.2 billion or 44% of the transportation spending goes to programs explicitly focused on planning and constructing roadways. When adding other programs that aim to make driving safer, modernize vehicles, and develop new fuel technology, the total rises to $400.7 billion. So building in the uncertainty of kind of the vagaries of what does it mean to make driving safer? Is that Mm. like building bigger, heavier cars? Or does it mean like better sidewalks and separating pedestrian infrastructure from car? Like, I don't know what that means. Make a robust system of like trains or public transportation. (laughs) A thing with statistically way lower mortality rates and way higher ridership numbers. Building in some uncertainty about exactly what that means. That still means that well over half of the transportation money in these laws is going to reinforce the driving systems that we already have, whether that is direct subsidies to EVs or reconstructing roadways to make more people drive more because now the roads are fixed. Mm. So it's encouraging a lot of driving and it's spending a lot of money to do it. But we end up like continuously sinking more and more money into a system that doesn't really have an off ramp. It doesn't merge with a robust <laughs> system of of high speed trains. Yeah, and I it's think we need to put a red light on. Nice. And get the system to stop. Wow. Clip it, loop it, <laughs> run it. One of the first things I wanted to talk about is fleet replacement, which is the concept that replacing all of the ICE, the internal combustion engine cars that we have on the roads right now, is going to take a lot of time. Not all of the cars on our roads are new cars, which is why when you see things like 80% of new vehicles sold in Norway are EVs, it's like, great. What about all of the cars that were sold two years ago? Right. You know, those are still going to be on the road for, for maybe 30, 20, yeah. 30 years. General estimates for fleet turnover are sometime in the 2050s, but that usually assumes a full ban on internal combustion engine cars by 2030, which would be great. California's got one cooking up. California's got one cooking up. I think it's going to be really hard to get like Texas to do it. Mm. Plus, how often do you see cars from the 90s that are still driving around today? You know, I do. I go, woo woo. You know, I really (laughs) shout them out. So the point is, we're going to have internal combustion engine cars on the road for a long time Mm. if we keep prioritizing roads and driving to accommodate EVs. Gotcha. In order to make EVs a thing, Mm -hmm. ICEs get to ride along with them for a much longer time. Exactly. Okay, okay. And part of where they ride is into the suburbs. I was sort of talking about at the top of the episode, but sprawl is a really big problem for climate. 
Sprawly Williams. Whoa. Pretty good that nickname. Would be, oh, you should do, if you do another zoning episode, uh-huh. we should do a character where we give you a big fake mustache that you put over your real mustache uh, or, and it's your evil lip. twin. Yeah. A fake lip that I put over my mustache. <laughs> so sprawl is bad for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, and I will refer people to your wonderful Climate Town episode about zoning and why Thank single family you. houses uh, are a problem. Featuring not just bikes. Featuring not just bikes and shot by me. Whoa, that's right. Yeah, it was in Colorado. Go. Way to go. So just to reiterate, Sprawl is bad for the climate for a lot of ways. One of the biggest ways is that it encourages a lot more driving. Mm. It creates this feedback loop where if you live in a suburb, you have to have a car. You drive the car around, but then you need somewhere to put the car. So the houses Mm. become bigger, the roadways become bigger, the driveways become bigger, and it spreads things further and further apart. So more people got to get cars to get around. Mm. That's a big problem. The concrete and asphalt used to build these suburbs is incredibly carbon intensive. They're working on inventing some some like new concrete that will like absorb carbon dioxide or new something. New concrete, not your mama's concrete. It's new like new metal. Right. New concrete. It's just concrete that wraps also. Right. Oh, Raleigh shook his head. He was mad at that joke. <laughs> no, I wasn't mad at the joke. I was thinking, oh, you, what you want from me is a freestyle rap. What you want from me, I can clearly see, is a freestyle rap from A to Z. I don't you think anybody wanted that. This is also not concrete, the kind of concrete, new metal rap. Imagine. On your feet. Stomp your feet on the ground. Anyway, it also, like, the houses there tend to generally be pretty energy inefficient. You have to burn a lot more fossil fuels or use a lot more renewable energy, hopefully, just to, like, keep the houses powered and running. Um, and it also, like like I said, it makes the land unusable for other things that could be much more helpful for the environment. So to sum up what I'm hearing from you, EVs just keep making the sprawl problem worse, which locks mm-hmm. us into more cars, which means more problems. Even though they might not technically be using as much oil, they will still be generating greenhouse gas emissions. You got it. And actually, I think you could make a pretty strong argument that the EV provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure Bill are only just barely climate policies at all because they take money away and focus away from stuff that would be way better for the climate. One of the provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that gets like the most buzz is this subsidy to convert to electric vehicles. On the IRS's website, they say, you may qualify for a credit up to $7,500 under Internal Revenue Code Section 30D if you buy a new qualified plug-in EV or fuel cell electric vehicle. So great, we're helping people buy new cars that are more environmentally friendly. It's also only a $7,500 discount, you are st- you still have to pony up the rest of the $30,000 or whatever. So it's like, well, okay. But importantly, it doesn't incentivize bikes or other micromobility that mm. is already pretty viable and would be a better option for people in a lot of ways. And actually, there was e-bike rebate legislation, but it was cut out of the final draft of the IRA. Really? And I don't know if that was one of the things that they had to cut to get bipartisan support from it, or if it was just an incidental casualty. Big Schwinn. Big Schwinn, baby. (laughs) E-bikes have smaller batteries. They would cost the government less to subsidize. They would help get cars off the road and reduce congestion. Due to their smaller weight, they're more energy efficient than cars. So in terms of like distance traveled per weight of battery, that improves. They're a good solution for kids and families. And the charging technology already exists for them around the country. A lot of this money that we're spending on EV infrastructure is going towards putting chargers everywhere so that you don't have range anxiety. Uh, But you can plug a bike into a wall. You wouldn't download a bike. (laughs) You could 3D print a bike. That'd be awesome. And also... Like there's, as with anything, there's high end and low end electric bikes. I looked it up. It seems like the average electric bike cost is between $2,000 and $3,000, we'll say $2,500, which means that you could give away three e-bikes for the price of one rebate. And then people wouldn't have to pay anything for the e-bikes. You could give them away. And that drives me crazy. Imagine that. It's like either you buy an electric vehicle and spend an extra $27,000 or will give you three e-bikes. Yeah. And it's like, oh, right, I'll do the e-bikes, please. Yeah. And I, I'll just use my shitty car. You know, when I have to haul furniture have or take something. take the e-bikes yeah. across the river. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a little bit of good news that I want to say about e-bike legislation because it might come back. I don't remember who introduced it, but they just reintroduced. It's called the e-bike act, but it's, I just learned this word on Jeopardy. It's called a backronym, which means they started 
with e-bike act and then they were like what can we make this into an acronym out of uh, it's, what are, it's got nomeo and juliet syndrome yes got exactly it. and it stands for the electric bicycle incentive kickstart for the environment act which is Jeez. cumbersome yeah cumbersome is actually an acronym which stands for cars under model keep going b- e b oh wow we missed b okay i didn't miss b i'm Boner. working on b <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll uh, tell you what, for the Patreon, we'll figure out what cumbersome stands for. But this bill was just introduced. I don't know where it is in committee, but call your reps and say that you support the E-Bike Act and it would like make a big difference for you and your family because it would be great to get that passed. So it seems like all of these solutions that aren't electric vehicles are cheaper, better for people, can be employed faster, and it will help change the infrastructure to a more public focused mm-hmm. human focused infrastructure a lot faster so why are we focusing all of our cash and resources on electric vehicles and the infrastructure to support them that actually also allows internal combustion engines to stay on the streets longer i think it's a combination of things i saw a tweet one time that was that uh, <laughs> i love that <laughs> that was very offensive uh no because i even tweeted about it because i tried to find it to oh, read yeah. it directly on this episode and n- nobody knew what i was talking about but there was a tweet that i saw one time that was like cars and car infrastructure like the reason we have so much policy about cars and car infrastructure is because cars have created a failure of imagination in the American mind. You know, we can't imagine what a world would look like without cars. So the only solutions that we're focused on are how we can make the existing systems better. It's why there there was another tweet. I have to get off Twitter. No, it (laughs) sounds like your your brain is stitched together from a network of tweets. I'm on Blue Sky now. Certainly that one won't backfire and take (laughs) over my brain. But there was another one that's like, so in the Cars universe, in the Pixar Cars universe, all the infrastructure is the same. There's no humans, but the infrastructure is the same because of how convenient everything is for cars. Wow. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just everything is so car focused that to truly transition, if I could snap my fingers and transition us away from car centered infrastructure, it would make a lot of things look different. When I talk about like getting denser and like less car centric infrastructure and more public transportation, I think a lot of people are resistant to that because they picture fucking downtown Manhattan and they're like, I don't want to live there. But there's like a zillion steps in between Highlands Ranch, Colorado sprawl and downtown Manhattan. And I will say downtown Manhattan is lined on every street with cars. Yeah. (laughs) It's not a lack of car-centric infrastructure. There's yeah. still fucking cars everywhere. Yeah. That's like, th- that's the thing about New York. You know it's got a lot of traffic. That's <laughs> You cut to an establishing shot of New York, and it's a low angle on like six taxis beeping and a guy going, hey, what's the matter, you? <laughs> yes, yes. When I say get denser, I mean like, what if there was a grocery store with walkable housing near it? I'm not even saying that we need to transition away from all of our cars. But I do think people should have an option to go somewhere without their cars. And then I think the other reason that it's so pervasive is that the auto industry has finally realized, you know, after it made so many efforts to kill the electric car, I think it's kind of seen the writing on the wall. And it's like, well, if this is going to happen, like climate change is on people's radar, this is going to happen. We need to shape this conversation in a way that still makes us money and keeps us in power. Mm, If you can't beat them. Pivot your business slightly to incorporate them, but still make a bunch of money off of it. Yes, okay. exactly. You know the phrase. And this actually segues great. Segways. Another non-internal combustion. Do you know the guy who invented segways died? Everyone knows died. the guy who invented segways <laughs> died on a segway. All right. Fine, then. I'll just continue with my dry facts instead of my fun anecdotes. We can mop up some of these facts, Nicole. <laughs> Um, Okay, so a big problem with cars in America and our focus on EVs generally is that cars in America are huge. Something like 85% of all new cars are either trucks or SUVs. How do Um, we get that to 100? (laughs) Well, we're working on it. Nice. Um, And a big reason for that is because of something called the light duty loophole. Um, And I worked on not just bikes. (laughs) A light duty loophole? (laughs) Great. Uh, It's something called the light duty loophole. (laughs) Wow. What would that be? It would be... Uh, it would be a loose a, anus. Is, is That's a, what it would be. It well, would be. It's like, oh, I, I got to do a... I got to go to the bathroom. Is it a one or a two? It's more of a light duty loophole. <laughs> It'll take me t- five minutes tops. Okay. I would like for us to never be close enough friends to have 
that level of detail in wow. our conversations. You you picked the wrong person to be friends with. <laughs> um, so the light duty loophole is, uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, I worked on a video with not just bikes um, about SUVs and he why they're so terrible. A name, Nicole. Jason from Not Just Bikes. There you go. No last name, but definitely first name. <laughs> I don't know his last name. That's not really? true. It's Slaughter. Slaughter. Um, which is a cool last name. It's true. You can't spell laughter without slaughter. Yes, you can. You can't spell slaughter without laughter. That's fucked up, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we making me the villain of the Your piece? words, not mine. You did say that crazy <laughs> fucked up shit. <laughs> Hey there, a little inside baseball. We record this very podcast at the Climate Town office. And if you're not familiar with Climate Town, it's a YouTube series we make for as cheaply as possible. And that means schlepping our camera equipment all over New York City. Yes, our backpacks are full, and the gear we reach for every time is peak design. That voice you just heard is Ben Bolt, the executive producer of this podcast and of Climate Town. That's right, Riley. I mean, this is an ad, but we are genuinely loaded with peak design gear, from backpacks to sling bags to camera camera accessories. And by we, I usually just mean Ben. Ben literally has like seven things from Peak Design on during any given shoot. Yeah, really. I mean, they make good stuff. Uh, My freaking phone case from Peak Design. My phone charger on my desk. That's Peak Design too. My out front bike mount that I can put my phone on. Guess what? Peak Design. You know that little tripod we use on Climate Town shoots? The little travel tripod? The little travel tripod. They got organizers. They got straps, clips, duffel bags, everyday bags. And they're not f***ing around. Peak Design gear is guaranteed for life whether you buy it first hand or tenth hand. And they can make that kind of commitment and not go broke because they build stuff to last. As my father would say, it's built like a brick shit house. And now I'm hearing it out loud, that term is a little dated. Peak Design is a certified fair trade B Corp that prides itself on recyclable materials and it lobbies lawmakers in D.C. for environmental legislation. They're also the group who nominated Climate Town to be an environmental partner with 1% for the planet. So double thank you. And they also have been a podcast supporter of ours from day one. And also, also, they just make really good stuff. So go to peakdesign.com slash playbook. That's P-E-A-K design.com slash playbook for 20% off some of our favorite products and a picture of Ben on set dripping with Peak Design gear. I'm literally going to try to put as many pieces of Peak Design gear as I possibly can into one picture. I'm glad we just got health insurance because Ben's back is going to be demoed. But not because the Peak Design stuff is heavy. The other shit that we put inside well, in it. Well, in bulk, it's heavy. If you if you stack enough all... Peak Design stuff. <sighs> yeah, okay. I'm but not saying it's sweet... heavy gear. They got a it's good shoulder gear. strap. It really takes the weight off your it's shoulder. It's going to crush you to death. If that's how I got to go, sayonara. All right. Uh, So the light duty loophole, insert poop jokes here, came about in 1973. Uh, This is around the time that the Clean Air Act was passing. And basically the Clean Air Act was really good for foreign manufacturers and not so good for American car manufacturers because foreign manufacturers figured out how to make their cars way more fuel efficient to begin with. So it wasn't so much good for foreign manufacturers as foreign manufacturers were making better cars. Correct, yes. And just American car manufacturers were not keeping up. So it, it would have penalized them more, deservedly. And and it's like, wait, wait a minute, we can't make the other guy's basket two feet taller? <laughs> no! Yeah, exactly. And there is also an element that, like, at the time, more fuel-efficient engine technology did make cars a little bit worse. And this is a time when like RVs were getting really popular. Jeeps had started to become like more of a consumer item instead of like a just for hunting item. And so there was some concern that these big vehicles were going to be on the roads. And if you put these fuel emission standards in place, then you get a bunch of RVs that struggle to make it up a hill. And then there's congestion issues. And as I recall, the 1973 gas crisis Mm -hmm. precipitated a lot of these where like there just simply wasn't that much fuel available. Mm -hmm. And so the US government forced auto manufacturers to make more fuel efficient cars, because then you have twice the fuel. Yes, basically. But it's also American car manufacturers didn't want to do it and they have a very powerful lobby. There were also some labor issues associated with it, so it's complicated. But basically, uh, the light duty loophole means that cars that are considered light trucks are exempt from or have much lower fuel standards. Mm. Um, and, so, and, and light duty trucks, this was a carve out for like farmers. 
Yeah, farmers and construction workers and industrial laborers. But not your daily driver. At the time, that's not what it was intended to be. Okay, okay. But American car manufacturers pretty quickly realized that they could have dominance in this area, particularly because of like some trade issues. Basically, it made it way more profitable for American manufacturers to put all of their eggs in the big car basket. You start seeing a real rise in trucks, in SUVs, in big heavy cars. And those air quality standards that kick this whole thing off even come into play with the electric SUVs, even though there are you know, no tailpipe emissions. Um, according to Vice, currently automakers must hit a fleet-wide target for cars of 181 grams of CO2 emitted per mile, but 261 for light trucks, a 36% difference. Under Biden's rules, car companies will continue to be able to pollute more with the vehicles they sell the most of. Mm. Um, and they calculate emissions for the e these EVs both in terms of like how much of the energy for the cars is coming from like coal-fired power plants, but also the CO2 generated to make the cars. So all of that is to say SUVs have become by far the dominant model of car in the country, even though they pollute more and are heavier and take up more space on the roads and just generally have a host of bad effects. So primarily auto manufacturers have switched over from sedans and tinier cars to giant cars. And when you start making electric vehicles, they're not making electric sedans as much as they are making electric large SUVs, trucks, that kind of thing. Correct. And oh, I okay. actually, you beat me to it because I'm going to show you this diagram. So to meet the Biden administration's requirements for receiving this subsidy on buying a new electric vehicle, a certain percentage of the battery components have to be made in America. Final assembly has to be made in America because it is a jobs program. I don't think that's necessarily the worst thing. I think it's a great thing. But the only cars that fulfill those requirements, there's seven of them. The Cadillac Lyric, the Chevy Blazer, the Chevy Equinox, the Chevy Silverado, the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Tesla Model Y, and the Tesla Model 3. What do you notice about all of these cars except the Tesla Model 3? <laughs> they are all fucking SUVs and SUVs trucks. or trucks, yes. So unless you buy a Tesla Model 3, you have to buy an SUV or a truck to be eligible for this tax credit. Wow. Um, the Chevy Bolt used to be eligible for the tax credit, but Chevy discontinued it in favor of stuff like the Equinox and the Blazer. Wait, what What the fuck? Why? Because they can jack up the profit margins a lot more. Oh. It just makes auto companies Why a lot more money. Why would auto companies do that? <laughs> yeah. Wait, they're not doing this for us. And again, just like the problems with EVs are more than just their tailpipe emissions, the problems with ESUVs are more than just like them having more carbon input into their manufacture. They're a huge contributing factor to people not wanting to ride bikes anywhere or even drive smaller cars. Um, they because they don't want to look like dorks. They don't want to look like dorks. Uh, but I can take an example from my personal life. My mom was in like a really horrible car accident where she broke her neck. Um, she got T-boned by a drunk driver in a pickup truck. And I'm to the point now where even though I hate cars and I think no cars should be SUVs and no one should buy an SUV, I want my mom in a tank forever <laughs> and ever because she broke her like we're lucky she's not paralyzed and that's the fear that a lot of people have because mm. there's so many big cars on the road the only way that you can feel safe is by buying more big cars and it's then an imagine arms race. It's, it's an a arms big race. car arms race it's an arms race and that's to say nothing of like pedestrians or cyclists who are too scared to take active transportation because justifiably these huge cars are putting them in danger and we don't have separate infrastructure Jeez. for them. We sh so the solution is big ass bikes, <laughs> like 30 feet tall. Yes, that'll probably do it. And by the way, I want to talk more about how much these cars weigh in a second, but a lot of these electric SUVs are more carbon intensive than smaller internal combustion engine vehicles. Like when they drive around? Over their lifespan. So, uh, the, so for example, I have a helpful bubble chart, which is just impossible to describe on a podcast. But it's basically, a there's a chart. bunch of gray bubbles, which represent the ICE cars. And then there's a bunch of green bubbles, which represent electric cars. And the farther over to the right the bubbles are, the more fuel efficient they are. You got all that, listeners? <laughs> and you can see in the compact section, there's a ton of gray bubbles that are further along than almost any of the midsize mm. electric vehicle. And then if you go down to like the full-size SUV and pickup, 
those are are way further behind a bunch of gray bubbles for smaller cars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I think what what you're what we're clocking here is that it doesn't make it lower emission if the startup cost was a ton of emissions up front. Mm-hmm. It's like going broke, saving money. Yeah, exactly. And in some ways, you would be better off just getting like a Chevy Malibu than the car that we're about to talk about, the dumbest car in the world, the electric Hummer, oh, which I'm going to show you a picture of right now. I think you and I can agree looks pretty cool and not stupid. Uh, you know... I think it looks honestly a little cool, but pretty dumb. (laughs) There's a little bit of a cool factor to it just because it's like as wide as a fucking street. That is cool. I don't care who you are. And you could probably, oh man, imagine a skateboarder skateboarding at top speed and this car is driving at him. And then he or she leaps up Uh the skateboard goes under they go over lands back on the skateboard i mean that would be pretty cool but that would be cool because of the skateboard or not because of the car you didn't let me finish it was a gas-powered skateboard oh no i'm owned yeah canceled i'm completely owned okay um i think the electric hummer is good to talk about because it's so stupid that it illustrates like a lot of important concepts so the first one is Electric SUVs weigh a lot more because they need a much bigger battery to power a much bigger car. Sure. So, so the rest of the battery is not is even heavier than the uh, engine and the gas tank and all the like, fuel shit. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, in SUVs, a lot of times you need a bigger battery just to move the weight of the battery, which oh. is stupid, but that's the only way to make the cars work. Yeah. So the battery in the electric Hummer weighs 3,000 pounds. The total weight of the electric Hummer is 9,000 pounds. Now, the electric Hummer is only rated to tow 7,500 pounds. So you actually can't use an electric Hummer to tow an electric Hummer. Wow. That is, it is a true bummer that it, it is all vanity and no performance. No performance at all. So the battery alone weighs 3,000 pounds. That is more than the entire Chevy Volt, maybe about as much as the entire Chevy Volt. Wow. So imagine getting hit by three Chevy Volts stacked on top of each other, and that's what happens if you get hit by a Hummer EV. You know what you should really do? You could sell somebody a Hummer EV, but it's just a shell on top of a Malibu. I mean, that would be perfect. I'm Like a Malibu wearing a Hummer costume. I think I was channeling this next statistic because according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, AC. AC, the new Hummer EV emits 341 grams of carbon dioxide per mile, demonstrating that behemoth EVs can still be worse for the environment than smaller conventional vehicles. So in comparison to that 341 grams of carbon dioxide per mile, and I that's, guess... And that's not actually per mile. That's It takes that much to make it, and then if you distribute it over that the lifetime of the car plus exactly the fuel plus that, the yeah. emissions from any fuel that is used to charge the car and the emissions to make the car so it's an effective 341 per mile lifetime correct okay. got it and then in comparison a gas-powered chevy malibu emits 320 grams per mile oh shit that's so, less yes so it's actually less over the lifetime of the car now assuming both cars make it 40 years the hummer might ultimately be prove to be more carbon efficient than the Chevy Malibu, Mm. but I don't, first of all, batteries degrade over time. I don't see a world in which the kind of person who owns an electric Hummer continues to drive it for 40 years, but whatever. I really wish the word degrade was more lyrically different from do great. (laughs) These batteries do great over time. These batteries degrade over time. (laughs) Oh, great. (laughs) Let's get 10 of them. Sounds awesome. So you would be more environmentally friendly to drive a Malibu than this stupid car. Wow. And now is the Chevy Malibu, that 320 grams of carbon per mile, mm-hmm. does that also include the cost to produce the Malibu? Yes, okay. because the ICE cars are generally much less carbon intensive to produce. To produce because you don't of, need the battery. Exactly. Okay. A lot of the carbon intensity is mm-hmm. in the battery. Gotcha. And I will say like part of that is an economy of scale. We've mm-hmm. made like a bajillion fucking internal combustion engine cars. So we figured out how to make them really cheaply. So with enough scale of electric vehicles, I'm sure that would come down a little bit. But 
still it's it it does really but demonstrate. it would come it would come down a lot if we were also making smaller cars with smaller batteries yeah that's true so it's it's less about the electric part of mm-hmm. ev and more about the v part we're still making vehicles yeah personal transportation vehicles and that's like the fucking meat exactly. of the problem remember 85 percent 85 percent of new cars sold in america are SUVs. So assuming we replace those all with EVs, we're ending up with a fleet of huge, heavy cars on the roads. And America's bike and pedestrian infrastructure is roads. It's we don't have, there's a few like nice parks with a bike path. But other than that, if you're riding a bike to work, you are sharing the road with these giant cars, which are actively putting you in danger. There's a reason more people don't bike to work who are physically able to do it. And it's because in a lot of places, it's legitimately dangerous due to these huge cars. Right. The other problem with these big, heavy cars is they put way more strain on the roadways and they cause more damage. We already, as we have seen with the infrastructure bill and the IRA, a lot of money is going to repairing roads and bridges, but roads and bridges are going to be damaged way more by big, heavy vehicles. Some EV proponents argue that that is overstated by, you know, uh, climate deniers and and auto industry reps. I think there's probably a middle ground, but it's impossible to argue that like my gas powered Vespa is doing more damage to a road than a Hummer SUV. You know, there was that recent parking garage collapse. Garages are not rated to have all of these electric cars. Electric cars are just heavier and there are very specific calculations that build in a lot of redundancy in parking garages, but these cars are so much heavier than other cars that even with that redundancy, It's a lot of weight. Wow. So we're going to start seeing an even faster destruction of the infrastructure. Exactly. Which, I mean, first of all, is just dangerous and will cost people their lives and be bad. But also in terms of climate will require much more carbon intensive investment in rebuilding the infrastructure that Mm. we're already building. So we just continue to rebuild a structure that we don't actually need. Mm -hmm. And if we prioritized a different kind of transportation structure, we could save all that money Mm -hmm. and all the money that we're using to rebuild the thing that's already not working Exactly on a thing that would work much more efficiently. Yes. Yes. We're putting all of this money into infrastructure, but it's going to enforce the same kind of infrastructure that we already have. So it's a little bit like we're in a sinking ship and there's a ton of holes in the boat Mm -hmm. and we're investing in more buckets. To like bail yes. the water out when we could just be building a, another boat, yes. a better boat, or just building something on the land that doesn't yeah. have to sink. I get really seasick, so I would love a land-based alternative. And the problem is much bigger than people just choosing to buy 85% of their cars as SUVs. It's really hard to, if you're like a sedan lover, it's hard to find somewhere in America that is an American-made car that you can purchase a sedan or a compact or some sort of smaller car. It's really hard to find. Almost all of the small cars on the road are foreign cars, and even those are being replaced by SUVs. Hmm. And it's because of some of these light truck loopholes that this is all happening. And that's a problem because there are a lot of like personal mobility reasons to have some kind of electric vehicle. There are small little tiny electric cars that carry one or two people. These cars are more energy efficient because like a bike, they can use a much smaller battery. And Most vehicle trips are just made to transport people from one place to another. Every trip that you make in an SUV, you could be towing something, but almost none of them are you actually towing Mm, something. mm. So having really small electric vehicles is a great middle ground where we can still have a lot of our existing infrastructure, but it will be much cheaper to own and maintain and drive these smaller electric vehicles. They also make more space on the road for like bikes and pedestrians. It's just safer overall, but you can't buy those cars. And that's a huge problem. Gotcha. And there is actually a model. People think that'll never work in America, but there are existing models in America where that very thing works and they're largely retirement communities. My parents recently bought a house in a retirement community that they will ultimately retire to. And almost everybody there gets around in golf carts, electric golf carts. They're much smaller than cars. They get them everywhere they need to go. They have a grocery store close enough that half the parking lot is always full of golf carts and not full-size cars. Mm. They're better for an older community because as they start to lose their driving skills, there's they're easier to operate and just less dangerous yeah. generally. You can get hit with a golf cart and not totally die. I still don't want to get hit by a golf cart, no but if I had to, to pick between a, a golf, golf cart. cart or a Hummer SUV, I'm taking the golf cart every time. That's right. So existing models for this 
are already here in America. And it's something that we could spread to, like, imagine if we replaced most of the cars in New York City with golf cart sized cars. That would be a huge difference to our streetscape. And then imagine doing it all over the country. Mm. And then imagine all the teens coming by and flipping them when the <laughs> Eagles won. I think I don't think it's the teens doing the car flipping when the Eagles win. You're I think right. it's largely like teens 45 like, year old dudes. Yeah, teens are like, we got homework that we need to do. <laughs> So that stuff already exists and is a viable, much more energy efficient solution. But nobody wants to talk about that because car companies want to sell their big ass cars. Yeah. From BMW, the cart. <laughs> <laughs> the all new Touring cart. Well, we just got to talk about turbocharging them. Turbocharge the cart. <laughs> XL cart. <laughs> So on this podcast, we like to wrap it up by talking about is this misinformation, which is kind of just like a rumor that spreads, it's incidental, or is it disinformation, which is like an active campaign to spread this information. For this one, I tend to lean on the side of misinformation um, because it is that failure of imagination thing. You know, Americans do a pretty good job carrying the torch for cars to begin with. And it's hard, it's hard to say I want to get rid of cars and them imagine a world different, it just sounds like I'm saying, I want to make it harder for you to get to the grocery store. Right, right. Which is not what I mean. I want to make it much easier for you to get to the grocery store. I think a lot of it is just kind of ingrained in us. But it is disinformation to a certain extent. You know, car companies are really pushing this campaign now. They've seen that they can make a lot of money off of EVs. They're replacing the entire fleet. They want to make sure that they don't become obsolete because we've created better infrastructure where people don't have to drive their cars so much. Yeah, um, as, as long as they can keep people using cars, they stand to make a ton of money yeah. because we're going to have to change over the fleet. Mm -hmm. You can't like update a car that you have to be yeah, electric. Yeah, you can't it's like the, rip the engine. The yeah. process of making the wheels turn is different. It's It has to be functionally different. So they have to sell you a new car. They can't just like upgrade your existing Chevy Malibu. Or you they, know? they could, but it would cost more than the cost of a new car. Exactly. So according to Scientific American, three of the four car commercials that aired during this year's Super Bowl were for EVs. Nice. So, yeah. <laughs> so they're very actively pushing the narrative. And I, I won't make us listen to it because you've done a whole video about that Will Ferrell commercial. But the point in that commercial that's most interesting to me is the part where he says, we're going to get everybody in an EV. Mm. And we don't want to get everyone in an EV. We want to give people the option to get out of an EV. Or to a get V. Out of get a out of that V, period. Yeah. Get out of that V. And into my car. <laughs> Fuck. No, wrong. Uh, <laughs> great. So it sounds like there was just like a couple of years between the time car companies were like, we don't need to make electric cars. Electric cars are for losers. And then all going all electric, everybody in all the time. Yeah. And I think that was largely just them reading the writing on the wall. Let's take a moment to separate the company of Tesla from the man of Elon Musk. A company that was around before Elon exactly. Musk bought it yes. with enough money to get himself considered a founder, Wild. despite not founding yeah. it. Yeah. But I do think that the success of Tesla made everybody be like, oh, we have to start making electric cars. Otherwise, electric car companies are going to outcompete us. But it was also helped with enormous government subsidies, too. The automotive industry has always benefited from a lot of lobbying, and this is no different. They have a very incestuous relationship with the United States government. And any sort of like big technological breakthrough like this, Tesla in particular, is a beneficiary of a huge amount of government money. So priority Prioritizing electric cars on a policy level and on a public budget level is what enabled car manufacturers and particularly Tesla to develop a car that could be financially viable in the market. Yeah, I remember there was like a low carbon credit that all of these car companies mm -hmm. had to basically pay to Tesla because they needed to make some low emission vehicles and they could either make them, which would cost them a ton of money, or pay a company that was making them. Mm -hmm. And that was always Tesla. So it was always a little cheaper to just pay Tesla. But then they're just like giving cash to your competitor. Mm -hmm. That became like an actual revenue source for yeah. Tesla. And so I think between the giving money to Tesla and also convincing the American government to like give us money if we promise to make electric cars. We promise. <laughs> I think that's kind of how the shit. Pretty please. <laughs> we don't have the money. <laughs> 
So for me, it's maybe not disinformation. There are a lot of benefits to electric cars versus traditional internal combustion engine cars. But looking at it through such a myopic point of view is missing a much bigger picture for how we need to address our transportation systems and the climate movement as a whole. Yeah, there's a much better way to live and more satisfying to more people than having everybody own a personal vehicle, Mm -hmm. regardless of if it runs on electricity or gasoline. Yeah. And it seems like we're being given the choice of Coke or Pepsi when all we really want is water. Ooh, baby, what a metaphor. Or maybe we want a, a nice craft beer. Uh-huh. It's whatever. It's we're having we're, we're, it's, it's two different kinds of piss and neither <laughs> one is water. Yes. That's a better metaphor cuz I actually really do like sodas. I don't. In this metaphor, that means you like internal combustion engines. Shit. Sorry. You blew it and you canceled. Again. <laughs> Sorry, you're yeah, one it, it's as long as it's an Odd number, you are canceled. Oh, it, they cancel each other out. It they, cancels a cancellation. It's a cancel cancel. It's a reverse, yeah. Yeah. I think I tend to agree with you. This feels very misinformation-y, although I think there is a pretty documented and systematic brainwashing of the American psyche to favor cars and personal transportation over public transportation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the auto industry has spent billions of dollars making cars, trillions of dollars at this point, making cars central to our lives. Mm. But I do think that they have done such a successful job with that, that now that attitude is sort of operating autonomously. You know, how many times have you heard just a guy with no official affiliation with the automotive industry be like, there's too much traffic. We need to expand our highways or there's never enough parking. We need to build bigger parking lots. It's to the point now where people are like advocating for their own car infrastructure. People have been robbed of imagination enough that they are continuing to perpetuate the systems that make their own lives harder. (laughs) Gotcha. So, Raleigh. Yes. It's Thanksgiving dinner. You guys have just finished eating. You've decided to wait a little bit before the pie course because everybody ate a little too much. They didn't pace themselves. That doesn't sound like my family, but I will go along with your little ruse, Nicole. I, we eat so much at Thanksgiving dinner. And it's, it's We got these good rolls that my grandma used to make, and I eat like 12 of those and then can't move for the rest of the night. Gotcha. Regardless, you're in between courses. You're milling okay. about. Uh, your cousin's there. Oh, okay. uh, he's your cousin's pretty well to do, but he dresses like a man of the people. He's got, you know, socks and Birkenstocks. He's carrying an NPR tote bag. Gotcha. He has really expensive, very forward glasses. Very like, I'm a glasses guy glasses. Got it, okay. got it. And he works for, secretly works for Lockheed Martin. Oh. And he comes up to you and he's like, hey, Raleigh. Ow, your glasses hit me in the forehead. They're very forward. Ouch. AJ, take those things off. All right. Uh, hey, Raleigh. What's up, AJ? Great news. What's You're up, a climate. Cuz? You and me get it, right? We're the climate guys in the family. Yeah, I think Well, so. I just wanted to let you know that I just spent $50,000 <laughs> minus the tax credit huh? on a new electric car. Everybody I know at Lockheed Martin's getting electric cars because we love the climate at Lockheed Martin. Wow. And I think we're going to fix it. Everybody that I've talked to loves electric cars. I think it's only a matter of time before they take over and then the climate will be fixed. Well, first of all, you're staring at the wall so you can put your glasses back on. Thank you. Uh, No problem. Uh, Second of all, that's awesome about your electric car. I saw a Tesla in the driveway. I wasn't sure whose it was. That's freaking cool. It's mine. Way to go. And what was your license plate again? It's like a vanity plate. Oh, it says uh, bombs, not hugs. And and of course, you only get seven numbers and letters. So I, how paid, did you... I paid the DMV for an extra long license wow, plate. Oh, that's very cool. Like a European cut uh-huh. license plate. Awesome. Okay. Congrats on the electric vehicle. Thank you. I will say that electric vehicles are not really the solution to climate change, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of problems that just focusing on EVs might create, first of all. Electric vehicles and vehicles in general are only about a third tops of the emissions. So even Mm. if every single car became an electric vehicle like that, we would still have, you know, two thirds or more of our emissions to deal with. Mm. And of course, we're like way, way over. We need to cut our emissions by more than half. And so this wouldn't even get us. 
And that's not really how electric vehicles are gonna come on. They're obviously going to slowly trickle into the market and allow uh, internal combustion engines to maintain a pretty big market share for a long time. Plus our infrastructure is already fucked up and EVs are a lot heavier and they're gonna cause our infrastructure to get a little more fucked up. Plus they continue to lock us into a car centric way of being instead of uh, public transportation. It sucks up all the funding and forces us to spend it on roads Ooh. and bridges instead of on tracks and, and light rails and high speed transit. And uh, basically it is good that you have an EV but I wouldn't get too optimistic about climate change going away because I think even with EVs, it's still going to be a really big problem. Interesting. So you're saying that the problems created by cars are much bigger than just cars and that trying to fix problems created with cars by buying more cars is like trying to kick your Vicodin addiction with fentanyl. Hey, um, I know that you are practicing your tight five uh -huh. for the comedy show this night to, I think tomorrow i'm gonna be really good at it you know what have a great time and just make sure you record it and put it on facebook live for everyone to see i will awesome let's have some pie sounds great aj how'd i do <laughs> i think you did great awesome can i sorry i just yeah. aj is my real cousin's name mm, okay. and he is awesome i really like that guy he does not act anything like the aj you portrayed just I was FYI. portraying a different AJ. Oh, okay, awesome. A, a parallel universe AJ okay. if AJ sucked. Okay. That would be a parallel universe because AJ rocks. Yeah. Okay, great. Please continue. Electric cars are great in some situations, and I do think that they are part of our overall solution to climate change. But creating more opportunities where people don't have to use cars would go so much further towards decarbonizing than just swapping every American's SUV for a much heavier electric SUV. Awesome. That's where I'm at at the end of the day. Sick. Well, let's get in our cars and drive away from this recording. <laughs> I did not drive here for the record. No one drove here. But we're going to drive away. Uh, yeah, we're going to steal a car and drive it in the ocean as a protest. <laughs> the Climate Deniers Playbook is hosted by Raleigh Williams, that's me. And me, Nicole Conlin. Our executive producer is Ben Bolt, and our audio producer is Gregory Haddock. Theme music from the wickedly talented Tony Dominic, and artwork by Jordan Dahl. Who, yes, okay, is my boyfriend, but that's not why we hired him. We hired him because he's very good at art. And our researchers are Knut Haraldson, James Krugnail, and Carly Rizzuto. We don't have the money. <laughs>